we actually uh, took a look at a really what we think is sort of the problem of the day, and this is the problem of uh, losses to no decision. And this is something we've been tracking now over the past few years, and it's been on a slow march upward. In fact, in our analysis, we found anywhere between 40 and 60% of all deals are lost to no decision. So it's a massive deadweight loss for the salesperson, it's a huge loss for the sales team, and it's a massive productivity sink for the CRO, the CSO, and their organization. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Reveal, the Revenue Intelligence Podcast. I'm Danny Wasserman, and today, humbled to say, we are joined by one of the legends within our space, as we'll frequently talk about today, standing on the shoulders of giants. You know him from one of his many bestsellers, most notably the 2011 hit that, as Neil Rackham talked about, as a game-changing seminal piece of work, the Challenger Sale, holding my copy in my right hand, hoping I can somehow get it signed by today's <laughs> guest, Matt Dixon. Matt, wow, what a treat to have you on Reveal. Danny, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I all I can say is if if you're if you're on, you just need to get out more and meet, meet more people. But I I appreciate the kudos. Thank you very much, and I and I really appreciate the invite. So, well, it is an exciting time to yeah. chat with you because obviously everyone is feeling what has been described as a macroeconomic downturn, and the timing right. of when you came out with Challenger was also very much centered around some of the headwinds. So some of the questions that we'll want to talk about today is, do we see the evergreen nature of the wisdom and the knowledge that you imparted on Challenger? Is that still relevant today? And I certainly want to hear more about the impetus for coming out with your latest book, Jolt. Sure. So really excited to, I think, start there. Could we yeah. hear a little bit more about this exciting new book release coming out? When can we get our hands on it? And maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. And and it's um, so if we take ourselves back to uh, maybe a time that most of us would rather forget, but it was March of 2020. And it was right around the time where we were all learning to bake sourdough bread. We were watching Tiger King, you know, all that good stuff. But because I'm a research geek, um, uh, myself and my uh, my partner in crime, Ted McKenna, who's a co-author of the new book, The Jolt Effect, realized that this was like a, a maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity to study sales in the way it had never been studied before, because as you remember, Denny, every like sales, which I think was on a slow march to becoming more and more virtual, like more of the sale was happening on on Zoom or Teams or WebEx, right? More of those conversations were being captured and analyzed. Suddenly, we went from like a slow kind of increase to like boom overnight, everything was happening virtually, and it was not just the the uh, mundane calls, you know, but it was the really critical calls, the negotiations, the consensus building calls, the, um, the the really tough calls with senior decision makers. Those were all happening on these platforms. So we decided to actually, uh, at that time, partner with several dozen companies who over the course of a year plus sent us about two and a half million recorded sales conversations, which we used um, uh, a conversation intelligence platform. I was working at a company called Tether at the time, and we use them. And actually, many of those customers uh, partners of ours or participants in the research, Gong customers as well. So you, sending us their Gong transcripts and we're using that platform to do the analysis. And what we're – now this is, as you know, because you guys are in this space and you you know this can be a little bit like boiling the ocean when trying to find insight. And we went after a question. So we kind of said, hey, this is a golden opportunity, but what should we study, right? What's the big question? Challenger was about the problem of customers learning on their own, you know, um, how do we how do we engage a customer who knows it all, who's decided they already know what they're looking for? Here's who we are. Here's how we fit into their value chain. Like here's how we compare to their competitors, etc. And um, or our competitors, and they, they box us out. So that was the story of Challenger. And Challenger, as you know, the punchline there was: um, look, in the, in a world where customers can learn on their own, what they're looking for is the thing they couldn't learn on their own. They're looking for a salesperson to bring unique insight. So don't come in and ask me what's keeping me up at night, which is what we taught salespeople to do for 30, 40 years. Show me what should be keeping me up at night. And that was the core message of Challenger. 
So this time around, um, we actually uh, took a look at a really what we think is sort of the problem of the day, and this is the problem of uh, losses to no decision. And this is something we've been tracking now over the past few years, and it's been on a slow march upward. In fact, in our analysis, we found anywhere between 40 and 60% of all deals are lost to no decision. So it's a massive deadweight loss for the salesperson, it's a huge loss for the sales team, and it's a massive productivity sink for the CRO, the CSO, and their organization. Um, and so we decided to look at that question. Uh, I think, by the way, and we'll probably talk about this, that problem is going to get worse over the next few years. And it's, it's kind of on a secular trend to get worse if we don't do anything about it in sales. But we, we took all this data in this powerful um, you know, uh, conversation intelligence uh, methodology and went out, turned those calls into unstructured text, used machine learning to analyze them, all trying to understand you know, what would motivate a customer to do nothing, especially after going through an entire sales process. And then more importantly, what do the best salespeople do to avoid that happening to them? Is there some something they figured out? Um, because we found in the data, they don't lose to no decision at the same rate that average performers do. And so that, that became the core of the story. And what we found was pretty surprising. So there's so many follow-up questions to that <laughs> preamble, Matt. One, and I'll try not pepper you with them all at the same time, but we'll stagger these. One is some of what I think inspired everyone's fanaticism with spin selling and Neil's work right. was just the integrity and the discipline of his data set. And yeah. then similarly, you earn so much credibility with Challenger for how meticulous you were. I mean, again, I think it started with 700 and finished with about 6,000 different right. data right. points. So a statistically significant sample. And now looking at the role of technology, I mean, mm -hmm. the vendors you mentioned, Gong and Tether, and there's also yeah. many others out there. I'm hoping and rooting for you and Ted that lightning is going to strike twice, that we have not just, again, a one trick pony with Challenger going on to global notoriety, but the Jolt effect achieving similar recognition. Does technology make that process of a two-peat or a three-peat game-changing seminal piece more realistic? I, I think so. Now, look, I, I think there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, Challenger, even, even I think Neil would tell you it's been selling, like there's a lot of like, there's stuff that is good and then there's a lot of luck that's, that factors yeah. into that too. And I think, you know, some of this is timing too, right? Where the sales world is looking for answers to really hard questions. Like Neil was writing about this problem of like, hey, our company's trying to shift from selling products to solutions. And some of our sellers are figuring out, but everyone else is struggling. What are the best solution sellers doing differently? And that became the, the bedrock of solution selling as it was taught for the next 40 years. Challengers, again, we talked about this, the story of salespeople being boxed out and, and what are, you know, in the age of information, over, information overload, I would argue, what do the best sellers do differently? And that was Challenger. And I, I, I hope that Jolt Effect will help us tackle a new, this new problem of no decision, which is, again, I think a problem on a slow march to getting worse and is likely to spike over the next couple of years with a downturn. But I, I think, you know, we've talked about, uh, Danny, this idea of like a Moore's, there's a Moore's law in sales research, which if you go back to Neil's team. He had, I think, about a 10-person team. It took him about 12 years to do the research. They physically, like literally sat in on 32,000 sales calls um, and studied, you know, several hundred variables, all trying to figure out what do the best solution sellers do differently. Fast forward to Challenger. You mentioned some of the data we use. We use more of a survey-based methodology uh, to write Challenger. We're still collecting data around that. And I think it's now upwards of 100,000 sellers that are in that global uh, database. But still, like that study to even write the book took us five years. Uh, it was a team of like, I think there were probably two dozen people who at some point cycled through as a member of the research team. You know, a, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. Now we got to our insights a lot faster than Neil did, but it was still pretty manual and, and heavy duty stuff. Now, the jolt effect um, using technology like conversation intelligence allows us to study sales at a scale and a depth and a rigor like never before possible. I kind of liken it to, um, you know, I think a lot of the listeners have probably been uh, following or checking out those awesome images that NASA is putting out from that telescope that the, was it the Webb telescope that shot yeah. out like a million miles past the moon or something. And it's just amazing, right? But it's like that stuff was always out there. But only now that we have the ability to look that far into the universe, do we see what what's out there? And it answers a lot of big questions that we've we've always wondered. And I think conversation intelligence is like that, too. It's a power, like Neil and his team could never contemplate the idea of studying two and a half million sales calls. We studied 8,300 different variables. 
but conversation intelligence, natural language processing, GPU powered analytics, like makes it all possible. So we actually got to from start to finish, like literally from when we kicked off this project to writing the book. Uh, it was a two year project with like like t- my, myself, Ted, and the members of the AI and, and data team we worked with, and that was so smaller team, much faster insight. And I think you know again this Moore's law idea applies if I'm a sales leader and I'm thinking about these big questions we've always grappled with, like, you know, who are our big competitors? How is our value proposition resonating or, or not? Are our salespeople doing the things they've been taught and coached on? Are they following the sales process, right? Are they talking about our offers? Are they positioning things in the right way? Are they handling objections the right way? Like conversation intelligence lays all of that bare. There is no more guesswork. Like you, you can now dig into the, where the rubber hits the road, the actual sales conversation to answer a lot of these questions. So for, for research nerds like me, it's like, kid in the candy store (laughs) so well i'm licking my chops over here thinking about that sequence we're continuing from where we started with neil to where we are now and technology's role in yielding efficiencies on the order of magnitude 10x 100x and now back to this notion of i know the cosmos and making a dent in the universe Mm -hmm. right thinking where we started which is beginning an agnostic sales approach counterintuitively using unconventional wisdom to say, hey, we need to overcome the inertia of wanting to change. And then in Challenger, getting people even to a place where they can see they want to change. And now in your latest book, The Jolt Effect, actually overcoming that inertia and then thinking about indecision as perhaps yet another game-changing seminal moment in our understanding and even more microscopic or surgical level. Talk to me a little bit about that continuum from even just I don't want to I want yeah. to most recently yeah. I can decide. Yeah, yeah. So the um, – and again, this is what this technology enables us. So we find things that like we had no idea. We didn't – We when the results are coming out of the model, we're like what is this? This doesn't make any sense given that we're, we're coming out of decades of conventional wisdom and sales that have always told us the opposite. So we, uh, the, the first, we had the total head scratcher moment, uh, Danny. So we, if you imagine, um, if you imagine a basically a basic buying journey, you kind of articulated it before, but we engage our customer in their status quo, right? It's so the way they do things today. Maybe they use a competitor's product. Maybe they use a homegrown solution. Maybe they, they've seen no need for conversation intelligence, for example, for Gong. Like I, I never knew I needed that, right? And so you've got to convince the customer that they've got to stop doing things the way they're doing them now and start doing them uh, a different way. The second step, um, of course, is they go from their status quo to agreeing on a vision. I'm, I'm there. I agree my status quo is suboptimal. I want to work with your company, your solutions, the, the chosen provider. Let's talk turkey. And then the last step, of course, is we get them to buy something, right? It's all great to get intent, but we want them to take action and actually purchase. What salespeople know is um, things almost always go sideways somewhere between when the customer says they're ready to move forward and when they actually do. And that's the moment where customers start talking themselves out of things that they seemed like they were convinced of before. They start what seemed like a sure thing is suddenly slipping from your, you know, your fingers. Um, they start to hem and haw. They waffle. They waver. They get cold feet. They straddle the fence. You know, they start to ghost us. They don't reply in a timely fashion the way they once did. They don't show up for our, our demos and our calls, and things just feel like they're slipping away from us. And the conventional wisdom in sales has always been that there is only one reason that that happens to you as a salesperson, and that is that you failed to beat the customer's status quo. You didn't put it to bed. You either didn't prove to the customer that what they do today is good enough, because they believe that what they do today is good enough. You haven't convinced them that there's a burning platform. It's leading to lost revenue growth opportunity. It's leading to you know lost market share, team disengagement, whatever the outcome is we focus on. But there, there's some burning platform they've got to abandon. So you, you failed to convince them that of that, or... Maybe they do believe the status quo is suboptimal, but they don't really believe that your solution is the better path forward, right? It's not a compelling enough alternative. Or it could be, yeah, status quo stinks. Your solution is great, but getting from A to B is is like the juice is not worth the squeeze. Uh, we don't have the time, the energy, the resources, so forget it, right? We have other priorities. But it, it has to be one of those things. Like salespeople now for decades and decades have been taught. And, and by the way, to be to be fair, we wrote about this in the Challenger sale too, the challengers are really good at showing the customer that the pain of same is worse than the pain of change. And so that is fundamentally a story about getting the customer, getting to breaking the, the death grip that the status quo has on our customers, right? And so what happens in those moments? Well, we found in our analysis is that when those customers show signs of, of cold feet, 75% of the time, sellers go back 
and they hammer the status quo because that's what they've been taught to do. And they've been taught that that's the only reason the customer's getting cold feet. It's the biggest enemy in sales and you got to go after it. And so the, it comes across in a couple of different ways. But the, the first attempt is usually a, you know, Danny, you must not have missed that. Did you see that all the zeros on that ROI project? You must not. You must have missed that. Like, let me talk you through the ROI. Let me, you know, did I mention this customer who loves us in your industry? Like, let me talk to you again about the case study, the success story. Maybe you miss that feed or speed or feature or benefit, and you don't fully appreciate how awesome this is. So I try to paint that rosy picture and, and kind of dangle the carrot in front of the customer. When they don't respond to that, we put away the carrot and we break out the stick. And so we start dialing up the FUD, right? The fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And what we're trying to do is kind of scare the customer into action. Look, these, Dan, these problems are not going to solve themselves. And remember you told me you feel like you're losing ground to competitors. By the way, we work with all your competitors and we can assure you, you are losing ground to them and you got to do something about this. Like again, create that burning platform. So this wasn't surprising to us to find that that is the standard approach when customers show signs of, of kind of wobbling and, and getting cold feet. What did surprise us is that it backfires way more often than it works out. So 84% of the time, when salespeople go back and they um, hammer the sesquo, sorry, we have a thunderstorm here, so getting a little, bro, thunder, bring yeah. in the thunder, Danny. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, Release the lightning, uh, yes. <laughs> cute, cute. And then thunder. the tornado. <laughs> so 84, there's an 84% probability that when they, when they um, try to reconvince the customer of the rosy ROI projection, the great features and benefits, or break out the FUD techniques, they actually make things worse, not better. In other words, they make it more likely the customer will do nothing. That was a total head scratcher to us because, again, it, it flew in the face of everything we've been taught in sales. Because if the status quo is our only enemy, we're finding is that going back and like hammering the status quo actually blows up in the salesperson's face more often than it works out. Why is that? And so we had to kind of take a step back and ask a slightly different question, which is, not what are the new techniques for being the status quo, but rather what would possess a customer to do nothing? What, what motivates somebody to uh, end up in no decision? And here's what we found. When we bent, went back to the, the data um, and we did the analysis, what we found is there are actually two reasons a customer will do nothing, not one. We've always been taught that the primary reason, if not the only reason, is that they prefer their status quo. Again, what I think, what I do today is good enough. I don't see need for your platform or getting from A to B is not really worth it uh, for me or my organization. Um, but what we realized when we did the research is that uh, that's one of two reasons. The second reason is not, well, it's not preference for the status quo, it's indecision about changing it. Now, I'll grant listeners that sounds identical, right? Those things sound almost like indecipherable um, uh, from one another. So let me peel it back one more la layer. When we look at indecision about changing the status quo, we found there are three drivers of customer indecision. The first one I'd call a valuation problem, which is we put a lot of options in front of our customer, all kinds of different ways to configure our platforms, different partner integrations, different bells and whistles, premium versions, basic versions, standard versions, long contracts, short contracts, enterprise-wide deployments, narrow deployments. And the customer's looking at all these options and they're saying, it all looks good to me and I don't know what to pick. And I'm afraid that if I pick the wrong thing, it might be an irreversible decision and I might realize later I picked the wrong configuration or I picked the wrong version of the proposal or the contract. So again, that's a valuation problem. The second one we call lack of information. So this is the customer, despite all of the information that they're swimming in, feeling like they don't yet know enough about this technology, about this solution, about this market, about this decision we're asking them to make. And so they feel like they've got to consume more content. Like I'm going to wait till next quarter when the Gardner Magic Quadrant comes out, or I'm going to talk to the, this analyst, or I'm going to ping my LinkedIn network, or I'm going to read more white papers. I'm going to wait till that gong webinar next quarter comes out because it's the next white paper I consume that will have answer all of my questions, right? So they consume endlessly. And then the third source of indecision is what we call outcome uncertainty. So this is where the customer feels like they may agree with your ROI projections. They may give you credit for a great proof of concept or pilot. They might, you know, say, hey, these reference calls were great. Love the case studies. Love the proof points. But what if this doesn't work out for us? I'm building a business case and going to my CFO, and it's predicated on these projections you've made. And if those things don't come to pass, I'll have egg on my face, best case. Worst case, I could get fired, right? And that, by the way, is going to be even more amped up as there's more budget scrutiny in the next couple of years. Now, here's the thing. If you look at those three things, I don't know what to pick, I haven't done enough homework, or I might be left holding the bag, and this thing might go sideways on me, the, set, the status quo does not make an appearance in any of those root causes. And so it could easily be that you have a customer who is 100% convinced that the status quo stinks, 
and they want to work with you and they want to buy your solution, but they don't know what version of the solution and how to configure it. They don't feel like they've done enough homework or they don't feel like you've given them enough assurance of success. There's no safety net here. There's no guarantee of performance and return. And so for one of those reasons, they may not choose to move forward. And so it help, hopefully it becomes clear then why when we treat every indecisive customer like a nail and all we've got is our status quo hammer and you go back and you start beating on these customers who are convinced to leave their status quo but instead are wrestling with one of these other sources of indecision, again, best case it rings hollow. Worst case it just gives them more to be worried about and they end up doing nothing. And here's the, here's the thing is that when we look at losses to no decision – most of them are actually a function of customer indecision, one of those three things we talked about. Fewer of them are actually because they prefer their status quo. And so it actually, the, technically, it was 44% of those no, no decision losses was be, were because or attributable to customers' preference for the status quo. 56% of them were because they're struggling with one of those other things. And so, again, we've got to be the, – the key message for salespeople is – Look, at the end of the day, you've got to beat the customer's status quo. Your customer's not going to buy anything from you if you don't convince them that there's a better way to do things, right, and that the status quo is suboptimal. They will, you will not pass go. You will not collect 200 bucks. Like, it all starts there. And so whether your approach is, is, is Challenger, whether it's Sandler, Richardson, Medic, I mean, take your pick, right? But those are all approaches built around this idea of beating the customer's status quo, getting them, showing them the cost of inaction, getting them to move forward. But once we convince a customer of that, what starts to occupy their mind is the fear of failure. It's not that they're going to miss out. It's that they're going to mess up. And it turns out that customers are way more concerned with messing up than they are with missing out. Nobody ever got fired for maintaining the status quo, but lots of people get fired for trying to change it and it doesn't work out, right? So, so we need a second playbook, and that's all about overcoming uh, customer indecision. When we talk about this second playbook, mm -hmm. looking historically at what was widely accepted – to be the gospel of overcoming the status quo bias, which you alluded yeah. to as our previous sort of understanding of how to be successful in sales. Yeah. And to codify the, we'll say the first playbook, to be successful in overcoming that status quo bias, challenger and the collection of attributes that make up that sales persona mm -hmm. will help you achieve your sure. presence club dreams and fantasies. Yeah. And now that we have the second gospel, the New Testament, so to speak, from Matt Dixon and Ted McKenna, I am wondering, is there still a place in sales for challenger tendencies? Or yeah. in fact, if we even go back to challenger and the five different personas that you talk about, do we still find in this new era of, dare I even say, heightened paranoia? Or yeah. is there a target on my back? I believe you talked about, you know, yeah. is there yoke on my face, blood on my hands? With that more pronounced roadblock or hurdle that we as salespeople have to overcome, does that invalidate challenger's place in a successful model or does Challenger coexist, but in a sequence with this new persona yeah. that demystifies all the information that helps elucidate the yellow brick road to help you overcome the indecision? Do we think about almost becoming, I hate to say schizophrenic, but more multifaceted in our approaches? Yeah, so I think multifaceted is actually the way to, to, the way to picture it. So what I don't think this does is say that all of these techniques and these approaches that we've learned over the years, whether Challenger or otherwise, to beat the customer status quo, that those are no longer relevant. Because again, 44% of our losses to no decision are because we didn't beat the customer status quo. And by the way, those are only the deals that end up in no decision. Think about all the deals we lose where the customer says, you didn't beat the status quo. I think what we do today is fine. I don't think you're the best vendor in the market. I don't think it's worth the journey. Um, so these are the deals that end up in, in no decision. And so beating the status quo is absolutely critical. It all starts there in sales. And so the last thing I would tell any salesperson is, Forget it. It's no. It's no longer a concern. Turns out, you know, a mille, you know, millennia of human nature is actually, you know, it's now over. Like we're all okay with moving away from the status quo. That is not true. We are we are engineered to be lazy and avoid change, even when better options are presented. And so, beating the status quo is job one for the salesperson. Again, I happen to think I'm biased, but I happen to think Challenger is kind of a state of the art approach for doing that. But what we also learned in this new research is that um, even those great salespeople, those challengers, they run a second playbook. So they've got their beat the status quo playbook, but in parallel, they're running an overcome indecision playbook. And the way I kind of visualize this is, again, when you engage your customer in their status quo, you get them to agree on a vision, express their intent to move forward, and then get them to buy. At some point in that journey, you need to switch gears from hammering the status quo to now thinking about 
helping the customer overcome their fear of failure, helping overcome customer indecision. The difference between those two playbooks is this. Beating the status quo is all about dialing up the fear of not purchasing. What we're trying to do in sales is help the customer realize the cost of their inaction. If you do nothing, here's what happens, right? That's absolutely critical. That's how we get the customer to say, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to move forward. Let's talk about doing business together. But as I said, once you put the status quo to bed, what then fills the void is all this fear of failure. Did I pick the right thing? Have I done enough, done enough homework? Has this vendor given me enough assurance of success? And so we've got to then overcome indecision. So if, oh, beating the status quo is about dialing up the fear of not purchasing. Overcoming indecision is about dialing down the fear of purchasing, right? It's about, again, instilling, I wouldn't even say the, the confidence, but the self-efficacy that the customer feels like, I'm making a great choice here. I can forget, I can take things out of my basket. I can forget these other options. This salesperson's guided to me to guided me to a perfect decision, a perfect choice. I've done plenty of work, a homework on my own. And by the way, I'm working with a true subject matter expert who knows way more about this than I ever will. And this person has my best interests in mind. They're not trying to oversell me. They're not trying to you know, hide the ball on me. I trust them to guide me to a great outcome. And then lastly, I'm not, they're not asking me to take a, take a, if you will, a blind leap of faith, but actually uh, jump over a cliff with a safety net, right? I'm taking a leap. It's a, it's a big move forward, but they've got my back and they're here to guarantee my success. They've seen how things go wrong. They've done this a million times before. And I feel confident that we're going to get those outcomes that we discussed during the sales process. So again, we need those two playbooks. And so I think the answer for salespeople, unfortunately, is... It's, it's a little bit like an old boss of mine used to say, I uh, talk about the tyranny of the or, because I'd be like, oh, do you want me to do this or that? And he said, there is no or, you got to do both. <laughs> and so, and I think in, in sales, unfortunately, in today's buying environment, we do have to do both. Think about those three drivers of indecision and ask yourself this, how many of, how many listeners out there work for companies that are offering fewer options and fewer partner integrations? There are no roadmap items. There's no, no bells and whistles, no different configurations. It's, the answer is like none of us. And any, all of us are increasing the number of options we put in front of our customers. That increases valuation problems. For how many of us are we in a market where there are fewer things being written about, fewer analyst reports, fewer opinions out there about us and our competitors? Like again, the answer is zero. Um, the amount of information about any of our markets, any of our technologies, any of our in industries today is way more than it was last year. And next year is going to be way more than it is today. It's just that you it, that amount of information is growing exponentially. And then ask yourself, how many of us are trying to offer cheaper, um, less sticky packages and solutions to our customers? Again, the answer is none of us. We're all trying to move up the value chain. We're all trying to sell enterprise-wide solutions, really sticky solutions that are hard to dislodge. And as we creep up the value chain, i.e. like as our stuff gets more expensive, more disruptive and riskier for the customer, that outcome uncertainty gets worse. So these are genies that we can't put back in the bottle. All of these things are going to get worse. And then if you layer on top of that, the downturn, this stuff gets amped up to a very high level. And so I think, again, 40 to 60 percent of deals lost to, to no decision is a huge problem. I think that problem is going to get a lot worse despite the downturn. And I think in the next couple of years, it's going to become the problem in sales that we need to be focused on. When you consider the various factors that I would say constitute the smoking gun for yeah. an ever more pervasive and evident, again, I keep coming back to this notion of paranoia, but I don't want to make the wrong decision for a host of reasons. Yeah. Did your research with I don't know, what you uncovered with Ted, were you able to pinpoint, is it just the abundance of information or in fact, is it also because of globalization competition, just the margin for error, even from when you publish Challenger, is that much more compressed that it's razor thin even within the last yeah. decade, giving people heightened anxiety that if I screw this one decision up, yeah. I'm hosed and does that leave us in kind of what I would say is an apocalyptic state of paralysis? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. So to be fair, I mean, we, we just studied this over the last couple of years, but I, I think you're right. Like if we had studied this over the past 10 years and this was a long-term study like Neil Rackham's was, I think you would see that level of indecision creeping ever, ever higher. You would see the number of deals lost to no decision uh, uh, mounting every single year. And again, I hypothesize it's going to get worse moving forward. We'll see because we're continuing to collect data, continuing to do, you know, uh, specific diagnostics for, for different companies and, and add to the data set. And so we'll see how that how that ebbs and flows in the future. But I think you're right. I think it, the margin for error is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. 
the tolerance for mistakes is getting lower and lower and lower. Um, the pressure on cons- customers and buyers is going up. And I think this problem is going to get a lot worse. You know, one of the things we found that was interesting is that um, when you look at, we were able to look at level of customer indecision uh, across these sales calls from low levels of indecision. So think of these as like the very decisive customers. People are ready to like run off tackle left and just buy. Like they're they're decisive, they're ready to move forward. By the way, all of your customers think they're decisive, but it turns out only 13% of them actually, you know, don't express any signs of indecision or very low levels. 87% 87% of all the opportunities we studied had either moderate or high levels of indecision. So for a salesperson, there is no like disqualifying your way out of this problem saying, I'll just sell to the decisive customers because there aren't enough of them out there to hit your number. So you've got to figure out how to deal with this and do something about it. And that's really what we focused on in the new book is, is what are, what is the, so, okay, I get it. I need new two playbooks. What's in the second playbook and how is it different from what I'm doing today as a salesperson? Did you and Ted examine what feels very paradoxical that we just talked about at the beginning of this episode, the efficiencies that through technology we have gained? So what we're able to accomplish in business far surpasses historically within the last few decades what anyone could have imagined. And conversely, there seems to be what you've described in, whether it's the omission bias or the paranoia, Mm -hmm. a increasingly inefficient psychology. And (laughs) as salespeople, those are at odds with one another. And did any conclusion come from that? Or were you able to decipher again, I'll use the word again, paradox. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of like the hurry up, stop offensive buying or like customer behavior. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really interesting question and hypothesis. I think just, just to hit on one of the things you, you mentioned before the omission bias, I, you know, before I mentioned, Customers, it, I, we get a lot of questions about like, okay, so you're saying they prefer the status quo or they're indecisive about changing it. What's the difference? So hopefully that's clear to listeners now. But but the other question we tend to get is um, what's the deal? Like why are customers, again, paradoxically, those customers who are like, status quo stinks, I'm ready to move forward, you have beaten my status quo, let's talk turkey and go through an entire sales process. Think about all of their own time that's consumed. Talk about a paradox, it's like, or, or just an irony the amount of time our customers sink into evaluating our solution to talking to our reference customers, talking to our engineering team, our customer success team, our product managers, our executive sponsors, and all of the team's time on their side, their legal team, their procurement team, all the technical users, you name it. I mean, they are sinking tons of their own time into it only to do nothing. And so I think still people look at this and say, well, why? Like, it's just so, it's, it doesn't make any sense that somebody would spend all of that energy and resource only to do nothing. And it does come down to what you mentioned before, this idea of the omission bias. You know, look, all salespeople are very familiar with the concept of loss aversion. We all know that human beings, our customers, um, are more likely to, they, they, they seek to avoid loss more than they seek to maximize gain. That's why we use FUD techniques. That's why we try to show the customer what they're going to miss out on if they do nothing, right? If they don't act, if they don't make this purchase. That's why we try to, you know, show the customer the pain of same is worse than the pain of change, as we talked about in the challenger sale. Um, but I think what w- there's a wrinkle to this whole idea of loss aversion. And that's this: is that there's two kinds of loss. The first loss is a loss of inaction. That's that's called in a, a loss of uh, or an error of omission. It's when you don't do anything and something bad happens. Um, but there's a second type of loss, and that's called an error of commission. This is a loss that is directly attributable to an action you took, and Between those two options, even if the loss is exactly the same, in like decades of human psychology, behavioral economics research has validated that human beings, if given those two options, you're going to lose this amount by doing nothing and you're going to lose the same amount, but it's going to be attributable to an action you took. We will all choose to do nothing every day of the week and twice on Sunday. In other words, we're totally cool with missing out. We are not okay with messing up. And this is just a human uh, dilemma. And I think what's interesting, you're hitting on this idea of you know, with technology, with product-led growth, and, and you know, we are accelerating uh, in many respects our ability to beat the status quo, but we are running right into a brick wall of human behavior, which is driven by the customer's fear of messing up. And the reality is no salesperson out there has ever been taught by anybody. There's never been any book written about it, never any research done on it about this idea of overcoming indecision. We've always believed well, if they're indecisive, it's clearly because I didn't beat the status quo. So I just go back and, and go to town on, on reconvincing them that they should move forward. But that's not what they're worried about more often than not. They're worried about something else. And so 
again, that uh, the message here is that that first part of the sale, we've got to beat the status quo, but then we got to shift gears and we've got to think about how do I get you from convincing you to move forward to now convincing you that the way you're moving forward, the choice you made, the amount of research you did, the assurances you got were really well thought out. You made great decisions. We've got your back. We're going to make you look like not like a fool, but like a hero here. And so it's a lot about risk mitigation, just getting our customer comfortable with their fear of failure. And here's the wrinkle about it, Danny. I would say that, you know, indecision is not something customers talk about. They, they talk about how they, they think their status quo is fine. I think our legacy solution is fine. I think the competitor's product that you're trying to dislodge is fine. I don't believe your solution is that much better. Or this is not a priority for us. Like customers talk about that stuff very openly. But no customer ever raises their hand and say, says, hey, I just want to let you know, I struggle to make decisions. Like they all think they're very decisive, but they're really not. Again, as we found out, uh, we talked about earlier, 87% of the deals we studied had customers with moderate or high levels of indecision. Now you asked another question about like the sources of that indecision, you asked that earlier. The reality is that that will change over the course of the sale. So early on, the customer might be worried about, have I done enough homework? You know, have I, am I smart enough here? Do I trust the salesperson to lead me to a great outcome and a great decision? Or do I need to be just as much of an expert as they are? Later on, they might worry about, okay, I think we're ready, but this all looks good. And should I pick configuration A, B, or C? And then towards the end, they might get really concerned about, it's a lot of money. And there's a, like, I've got a bullseye in my back. If this doesn't work out, I'm in a lot of trouble, or I'm just going to look like a fool. And so do I have any guarantee of success? Does this vendor really know what's at stake here? And are they going to help me deliver the goods? Or is this thing going to go sideways and I'm going to get fired, right? So it will change over the course of the sale. And you will find customers who are concerned with multiple of those things. And so it's actually kind of hard to pinpoint like this one's the big one, that one. Because it for one customer, it could be this in the beginning, this in the middle, this at the end, or some combination uh, thereof over the course of the sale. When I think back to the many takeaways from Challenger Sale, it was twofold. I mean, you could say more, but for me, just to oversimplify my experience with the book, it gave me tactics to both pressure test, mm -hmm. status quo bias and the inertia of not wanting yeah. to change whatsoever. And by extension, very specific plays I could run back yeah. to the word tactical to dismantle that yeah. resistance to change. And thinking about your new book, The Jolt Effect, is the same true where you not only illuminate ways to diagnose and triage, ah, these are symptoms of indecision. Right. But then after you've deduced, ah, I have indecision on my hands, here's how I cure it or here's how so I like, treat yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so Jolt is actually, uh, the, it, it, I think the big question people have is like, okay, I get it, two playbooks, but what's in the playbook? What do I do yeah. differently? Like it's all well and good to tell me I'm hosed, but I would prefer <laughs> if I wasn't, I could do something about yeah. it. Um, so the Jolt is actually an acronym and it stands for four behaviors we found in the data that high performers have you know developed on their own because they're high performers. It's kind of this lead steer effect, right? They they figure out which way you know where the obstacles are and which way to go in light of changes in customer buying behavior, and they adapt their sales approach. Nobody ever taught them to do it. They never got any coaching on it. They never wrote a book about it, but they figured it out on their own. So we distilled from this mountain of data that there were four things they did, and um, these are the four kind of letters in Jolt. So the first thing they do is they judge the level of indecision. We talked about this a little bit. But it all starts there. In a world where, you know, if you will, we know 87% of our customers are moderately or highly indecisive, but 100%, nobody ever talks about it, right? These are personal fears. Customers are not comfortable talking about this stuff. So as salespeople, we've got to be really attuned both in an active listening approach, but also by doing what we talk about, um, sending out pings and listening for echoes back from our customer that are designed to surface that indecision, get it on the table and start a conversation about it in a professional, respectful and, and very empathetic way. High performers will qualify and disqualify opportunities. They'll forecast uh, and they'll decide on their play uh, when selling, not just on a customer's ability to buy. So what the opportunity looks like on paper. Is it a good industry for us? Is it a good use case alignment? Do they have budget? Is the company on the upswing or the downswing? all that important stuff. Have I done the challenger thing? Have I taught them to value something only we can do? They will qualify not just on ability to buy, but also on ability to decide. So they're trying to ascertain, even from the very first uh, sales interaction, what is, is there a source of customer indecision? Are they concerned about something? And can I distill that and, and ascertain that? 
what is this person's personal level of indecisiveness? Like, are they may be surrounded by people who make decisions, but what about this individual? What about the others on the buying committee, right? And are there things that are amplifying the indecision, like a downturn where cash is king, where there's a lot of budget scrutiny, where there's a lot of focus, or maybe their last big purchase blew up in their face and they've got, you know, they've got bad memories of that and they're about to head down this path again with another vendor. So they're bringing that baggage to the table. Or it might just be they've got to spend money this quarter and there's a lot of time pressure, which would amplify normally latent levels of indecision. So that's a J. Judge the level of indecision. That tells us, is this a garbage truck we should stop chasing? Um, if it is something we want to engage, a customer want to engage, how do we forecast them? And it also tells us what the rest of the playbook looks like. You know, how do we overcome that indecision? The O in Jolt is offering your recommendation. So like it, we all know that it's awesome to, to let a thousand flowers bloom, especially in marketing and in those early sales interactions. We love painting the art of the possible, right, for, with our customers. Like, oh, yes, like we can do anything. We can integrate with that. We can integrate with this. Our platform does this. It does that. Check out our roadmap. There's these cool things coming. You know, let a thousand flowers bloom, baby. <laughs> but at some point, we know from the paradox of choice research, Barry Schwartz's work, that that amount of choice will, which is early on a good thing, will actually start to work against us, especially when the customer can't choose between those options. If they all look good, then they're looking at potentially making the wrong choice, or doing nothing. And it turns out doing nothing often wins out because they're not afraid of missing out, they're afraid of messing up. So they'll choose the path of no decision. So we have got to guide them to the right, we have to go from a thousand flowers down to a, a choice set for our customer defined by us and by what we know other customers have positive experiences with, customers like them. And then we've got to put our personal seal of approval on it. Here's what I would do if I were you. And this was so interesting to, to go back to the audio tape, right? To go back to the conversations and hear the way that these gifted salespeople position their recommendation. You know, Danny, I work with a lot of companies like you. I know you're weighing all these options. I've shown you a lot here, but I got to tell you, based on what, just what I know about you and your organization, having spent some time with you, based on what other companies just like you get a lot of value out of, here's the configuration I would pick and I wouldn't even look in the rearview mirror. Let's just go. And what it does is it allows the customer to narrow up that choice set, make an actual decision. Um, by the way, you know when you're putting options in front of the customer, not doing nothing is not one of those options. So it's like yes is the default, and that's what we're trying to see our customer to. But it instills that confidence, and it also allows the customer to place a little blame on us, right? So I'm not – you told me to order the, the fish or you told me to order the pasta. And so if I don't like it, it's kind of on you too. Um, the L is limiting the exploration. So again, our customers are going to struggle with, have I done enough homework? Left to our own devices, they will want to consume content endlessly. But the average performers in our study will indulge every single request, even those superfluous requests long after the customer has done enough research and they know enough to make a decision. They will say yes to more demos. They will say yes to more reference calls. They will say yes to more iterations of the proposal. You want to wait till the next Gardner Magic Quadrant comes out? No problem. Go ahead. And what's dangerous for sales managers is your average performers are ticking boxes in the CRM system because it's activity, right? Oh, they want another demo. Oh, they want another reference call. Oh, they're going to join our webinar next month. Yep, like we're moving this thing forward. But all we're doing is inducing their analysis paralysis, right? And they get wrapped around the axle. They have too much information. And then again, they choose to do nothing because what they're worried about is maybe it's the white paper I didn't read that has all the answers, right? And I'm going to wait until I've consumed everything. Now, how do we overcome that as salespeople? Well, it's a bit of an overused term, I think, in sales, but we've got to position ourselves as a trusted advisor. We've, we've got to, if we want our customer to stop doing their own research and trust us, We've got to instill the trust that we're not trying to hide anything from them. We're not trying to oversell them. That happens. We saw this all through these sales calls. High performers will proactively point out things that the customer shouldn't buy, things that they shouldn't consider, even from their own companies, right? They would actually even suggest places where their competitors are better than they are at X, Y, or Z capability or use case. And say, hey, I, I, might, you know, I know you're interested in that. We, that's not where we've chosen to invest our product resources and uh, in dollars, but I know people over there would be happy to put you in touch with that company. Sounds like you might be a better fit for those guys. They are unashamed, uh, you know, they, they unashamedly share, I wouldn't say the dirty laundry necessarily, but instill the confidence in the customer that I'm not trying to oversell you and I'm not trying to hide the ball from you. I can be trusted. Then secondly, they want to instill, they want to position themselves as a subject matter expert. So it's one thing to be trusted, but it's another thing to be seen as an expert. And this is where we saw an interesting cleave in the data. You know, average performers 
are far less likely to do their own demos. They are far more likely to bring the clown car of experts to the call, you know, the solutions engineers, the subject matter experts, the product folks, the CS folks, executive sponsors, you name it. But what high performers know is that um, if your only value to the customer is that you're a glorified admin and you can really just get the people who know the answers to their questions on the phone, and I'm working with you as a customer, then I'm going to continue to do my own research because you don't know much more than I do about this decision. And I won't feel confident until I do my own research. So we've got to, again, build that trust, but we've also got to establish our subject matter expertise and show the customer we know more than they do. It's The, the, the metaphor I would use here is, it's like if you went to go visit a um, country you've never been to before and you, um, you didn't know where to go. You didn't know how to get there. You didn't know what cities to visit. You didn't know where to stay, where to eat, what to do. Finding that travel agent who's been there before multiple times, who've, who's arranged multiple trips for you, who gets to know you, is not trying to put one over on you, not trying to oversell you, and their only objective is to get you to an awesome decision – you're not reading any more TripAdvisor reviews. You're not reading all the, the blog posts out there. You're saying, you know what? I'm with you. You tell me what to do. I'm in good hands. That's what, that's what we're trying to achieve here. That's how we get people to stop doing endless research. And then the last thing is T, taking risk off the table. So remember, the, in that final moment, in the 11th hour, where the customer's just about to, their pen is hovering over the, the contract or their finger is about to click the, the electronic signature on the DocuSign, the space between the tip of their finger hitting the automatic signature and the docu sign, like the button, is filled with outcome uncertainty. Am I going to get what I'm paying? What I'm paying for? What we expect? Because if we don't, I'm going to look like a fool, or I might get fired. And so we looked at all the ways, both informal and formal, that best salespeople de-risk the purchase for their customer. So you know things like opt-out clauses, prorated refund offers. Um, uh, things like um, adding professional services to a to an implementation. You know, I know you want to do this yourself, but what I really like to do is re- reserve some money for a slug of professional services hours. In the off chance this doesn't go swimmingly, we've got the A team lined up to help get you back on track. Right? I'm not giving away for free. You're going to pay for it, but it's a it's a safety net. Right? Creative contract structuring, suggesting to our customer, you know what? You probably shouldn't roll this out enterprise wide. Why don't we start with a hundred seat licenses? prove it out, get some runs on the board, and then go big from there. Because what that high performer knows is you, you're you talking about enterprise-wide, but that's going to take me forever to sell that deal. And when you buy it, there's going to be a ton of pressure on you as a customer to deliver outsized ROI immediately. I'd much rather start small and, and land and expand, right? So so all these different techniques that high performers use to to take, to take de-risk the purchase. So you put it together. It's, it's a playbook. I think the acronym kind of is memorable for people, but... It's, it says what it does, right? We're trying to jolt our customer out of their stuck, indecisive state and get them moving towards action. Well, at the close of this podcast, I think we can all agree. Back to your metaphor of the travel agent. Thank you for guiding us through what surely is many countries of behavioral economics and buyer psychology and the latest scientific research, which is pushing the sales industry forward. One or two more questions, since I know we've sure. exhausted our... I don't know, time and overstate our welcome with you, Matt, but we could stick around for hours. As the travel agent, if we stick with that analogy, obviously you are well-read and informed with other truly historic landmark pieces of research. Neil Markham's with Spin Selling, your own work right. with Counter Sale. I think a lot about Daniel Kahneman's book, the Nobel Prize yeah. winning piece on thinking fast and slow. A lot mm-hmm. of our salespeople are huge proponents of Chris Voss, never split the difference. Yep. For the nerds on the call that want to continue <laughs> to have their minds just absolutely shaped yeah, yeah. by thought leadership, would you leave us with a list of other pieces of research that helped you and Ted and the rest of your team think more critically about a profession. Any, I'd say just your short list of must-reads if you want to think about a career in sales. Yeah, look, I, I love, you mentioned one of them before, but uh, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. I, you know, we went back to a lot of that early behavioral economics work around, uh, you know, emission bias, loss aversion, prospect theory. And, you know, what we're talking about here with indecision, and actually even what we talked about with, with the other book around um, overcoming, you know, being the status quo, the challenger sale, it's a lot about it's not about customer behavior it's about human nature right there these are not things that are unique to our customers and i think for you know any salesperson it's a good investment of time to understand why people do the things they do or don't do the things that we think they should do or they say they want to do what leads people to um, to do the thing you know to value things certain ways to make certain decisions or not make indecisions 
or might not make decisions, get wrapped around the axle with indecision, I should say. But what? how are people wired? And I think, you know, selling is such a, you know, people sell to people, as the old adage goes. And, um, and it is a very human pursuit. And I think really gifted salespeople will take the time to understand how the the customer's mind is wired, right? And and by doing so, they're being very customer centric. They're putting themselves in the customer's shoes and they're trying to understand why they, you know, why they behave in certain ways. And once they understand that, I think they come to a deeper appreciation uh, for, you know, what the customer needs help with. So that's a that's an awesome one. I also love um, and I would I would encourage everyone to check out Dan Pink's new book, uh, The Power of Regret. You know, Dan, it's interesting because he talks about um, uh, the loss of inaction. He talks about the uh, omission, you know, uh, the the fear of um, of uh, missing out. You know, he writes this book where where he talks about, and this is very true, is that while customers and people in general are are more concerned with messing up than missing out, what's ironic about that is that later in life, think about a customer. Um, you know, ten years down the road in their career, their biggest regrets um, tend to be not the decisions they made that backfired but the opportunities they missed out on. Boy, we should have bought that company. Boy, we should have invested in that system. Gosh, we really missed the boat here. Um, the same is true for us as individuals and humans are just thinking about, you know, what are your biggest regrets? So it's what the concert, I, I didn't, I could have gone to Woodstock, oh, I'm not that old, but I could have gone to Woodstock and I, I passed up an opportunity. I want to stay home and like play video games or I um, I don't think there were video games at Woodstock, but never mind. You, you guys get the point. But, uh, you know, I didn't ask a certain person out on a date and I really could have, it could have changed my life. I chose to go to this college instead of that one. I didn't study abroad. You know, there are these things that we really, um, we, we regret later in life and it's usually the stuff we didn't do. It's the inaction. But what's important for the salesperson to realize is that those regrets really only come up much later when the customer has the benefit of the rearview mirror looking back and saying, you know what, we would have been much better off had we bought, you know, Gong or had we invested in Salesforce or had we done, you know, whatever, any number of platforms, gosh, it really would have transformed our business and we didn't do it. And, you know, there's a gap in the market and boy, I feel like I was, I'm a rube for having missed on that opportunity. But right now, that doesn't do a salesperson any good when they got to close a deal this quarter or this year. And so we got to get them comfortable with that fear of failure. We can always point to the the you know dialing up the fear of missing out, but we got to understand what they're really uh, more concerned with is messing up, at least right now. And once we get them over that hump, we give them less to regret later on in their business careers and in life that they made those great decisions. They took action, decisive action. They move forward and they reap the benefits uh, from making those decisions. So I check out those two books. I think those are wonderful. Lots more. I'm, I'm a nerd, but <laughs> those are two I'd suggest. Well, that's a great list. And on the topic of regretting the decisions you didn't make, for listeners of Reveal, I assure you, you will regret not buying and reading the <laughs> book by <laughs> Matt Dixon and <laughs> Ted McKenna. <laughs> so one final question that we ask all of our listeners on Reveal, Matt, if you could describe sales in only one word, oh, what man. word would that be? Hmm. Oh gosh, I, I just, I worry, because with one word I worry about picking the wrong one. <laughs> the valuation problems, Danny. So I think it's, um, I think it's, I love, I love the idea of insight. I mean, obviously I'm biased. Mm -hmm. um, coming from the, the challenger world. But I do I do really think that this concept actually ties all the way through to the new work as well. And the challenger customer, right? That book we wrote after the challenger sale. So in a world where customers can learn on their own, what they really want is the thing they couldn't learn on their own. And for salespeople, boy, what a, what a privileged place that we're in to have our customers looking to us to bring new ideas to the table. You know, we, yeah, it's all great that you know everything about your product and the feeds and speeds, what I want to know is the thing I don't know. What are your best customers doing with your solution? What are the things they're thinking about? Be my window into the outside world. That is when we can have those conversations is super powerful. Now, talk about the challenger customer, this idea of like, what is it that gets a buying committee that left their own devices won't agree on very much to come together? It's those insights, finding that mobilizer, that challenger customer who will forge consensus across that dysfunctional buying committee. Think about the jolt effect, right? A lot of what we're talking about is insight into you know the, the thing you should choose. Insight I can provide that gets you to stop doing your own research and trust me 
as your subject matter expert, as your trusted guide in this journey, an insight around how this is going to go and all the pitfalls we know are out there that you don't need to worry about because we've done this a thousand times before, so you're in good hands. So these are, you know, that idea of insight in bringing those things the customer doesn't know. Because look, the customer's got a day job and it's not to be an expert in our product, our service, our technology, our solution. That's our job. And so it puts us in a really important position with our customers and they're looking to us to provide them insight around what they should do. How do I forge consensus? How do I make sure this doesn't blow up in my face and go wrong? I need you to bring those ideas and those insights to the table to, to help me lead me to victory. Well, Matt, I cannot think of a better way to think of how to wrap what has been an anthology of wisdom and insights that you've shared with us. You heard it first from the authority on all things behavioral economics, buyer psychology, and sales, Matt Dixon. Sellers and leaders out there, we carry the burden of expectation to present and deliver insightful comments, remarks, and illuminating points of view to our customers should we hope to be successful. Matt, thank you a million times over for joining Reveal. It's been an absolute treat. Yeah, Danny, thank you. It's been a blast. I appreciate the invite, and uh, let's continue the dialogue in the future. All right. Listeners, be on the lookout for Matt Dixon and Ted McKenna's The Jolts Effect. We'll see you next time.